a great event today and I'm really appreciative to the Estonian Embassy for uh, setting this up and bringing uh, such a distinguished group of speakers. As you know, uh, it's the 10th anniversary of the 2007 uh, Russian cyber attacks on Estonia that in some ways were a watershed moment for this discussion. And what we're here to talk about today with a, a great group is how the country dealt with the pressure, what they've learned from it, and where we might go in the future. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers. Uh, let me tell you the agenda, which is that first we'll have an introduction from uh, Lori Lepic, the ambassador. That will be followed by a video with uh, the former president of Estonia talking for about 10 minutes. He actually talked for 30 minutes, but we trimmed it down. Um, <clears throat> and the full video is online if you want to see it. Uh, that will be followed by two panels. So uh, with that, let me introduce uh, Ambassador Lepic. Thank you. Oh, I... I said introduce him and I didn't do anything. He's been the, uh, he was the ambassador of Estonia. He has extensive NATO experience, uh, both being the, the Estonian ambassador to NATO and the uh, deputy perm rep to the North Atlantic Council in Brussels, uh, senior counselor in the defense section of the Estonian delegation to NATO. And of course, this is his second tour in Washington. So he's, uh, he's practically a local, uh, Mr. <laughs> ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, CSIS and uh, especially Senior Vice President Jim Lewis for organizing this event, or helping, helping to organize this event. Um, cyber attacks against my country a decade ago have been widely seen as the first of a kind in modern history. Our adversaries have learned their lessons and are operating in much more refined, sophisticated, and I would say cynical way uh, now, as we all have now by now realized. It is, in my view, however, equally important to have a conversation about ourselves. What are the most important lessons we have learned and, and acknowledged? How have we taken cyber defense and our way of life in digital world forward? In past 10 years, Estonia has had an opportunity to play its role in discussions and decision making on numerous cyber related issues. In international law, in shaping NATO's and EU cyber defense policies, but also building up domestic resilience not only through new technologies, but also through cyber hygiene or human firewalls, as I like to say. Finally, as Estonia holds the presidency of the European Union till the end of this year, obviously everything digital is very much on our agenda. We hosted the EU Digital Summit and organized the EU Defence Ministers first ever strategic cyber defense exercise earlier this year in Tallinn. And we did that in order to kickstart a broader discussion on the possibility of life in the digital world. I'm happy that today we are extending this discussion to Washington and the United States, as you all in the States play a key role in shaping the digital world. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope you enjoy the two panels. Uh, as you might know or notice, um, the panelists are all in inclusively my countrymen, and this is done in on purpose as they will speak about um, our experience um, in the past 10 years. Thanks very much. It's true all the panelists are Estonian, and they said if I became boring, they would just start talking in Estonian, so something to be warned about. Let me go through the agenda very quickly and introduce the panelists. Uh, the uh, upcoming video will be, of course, Thomas Ilvas, who was president of Estonia, actually landed uh, while the attacks were beginning uh, and was president in 2007. We'll see his remarks. He'll be followed by two panels. 
The first panel are the lessons from cyber attacks, what happened and what we learned. Uh, that will be Laurie, Al Laurie Allman and Marika Cascio. Kao, well, I was close. You look on the bright side. Um, Laurie, of course, is uh, now at an Estonian cybersecurity company, BHC Laboratories. Uh, he was the uh, permanent secretary in the Ministry of Defense, uh, basically an undersecretary in the Ministry of Defense in 2007. And he served on the team that organized the response to the cyber attacks. Um, Marika is uh, chief technical officer, Farsight Security, uh, a new company, but was uh, deeply involved in the 2007 incidents and will, will tell us about a uh, long, extensive background in the IT industry and will tell us how that um, helped shape the response. Um, the second panel, connectivity versus security, setting the rules. Um, the panelists include Marina Kalyurand, who's the former foreign minister, uh, current chair of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, uh, Quite twice, uh, twice the Estonian uh, national experts to the UN group of government experts. Having survived three, I can tell you that being at two is a remarkable experience. And Marina was always exceptionally uh, valuable as someone who helped contribute to progress. So um, she brings a deep knowledge of the norms process, both from her previous work as foreign minister and expert and her current work on the panel. Um, Tanel Sepp, many of you may know him. He is now the Deputy Director for Cyber Planning at the Ministry of Defense, but previously he was the Deputy Chief of Mission here at the uh, Embassy in Washington. Oh, and I should have said Marina has been uh, ambassador to every country on the North American continent, plus uh, ambassador to Russia. So a unique experience to be both the ambassador to the U.S. and Russia here. Tanel was at the Embassy here in Washington now at the Ministry of Defense, currently deeply involved in planning, uh, EU planning on how to respond to cyber attacks. Uh, Merle Magra is the director of the, new director, I should say, of the Cyber Defense Center, CCDOE, in uh, CCDCOE in, in, in Tallinn. Um, many of you have probably been there. It's a, it's a great uh, effort. Uh, your annual conference in the spring uh, SciCon, something to look forward to. This is sort of, tomorrow will be the kind of Washington equivalent. And prior to that, again, extensive experience in NATO, including being the policy advisor in the Secretary General's office. So uh, a deep background in, in policy and, and NATO. Uh, finally, we have uh, Juhan Lepasser, who is the head of cabinet for Andres ANSIP, vice president of the European Commission. And he will be joining us. No, he's not here. It's true. We're, we're keeping our finger. Is he here? No, but we expect him to be here. So uh, I'll reintroduce him when he reappears. But with that, can we turn to the video, please? So you were president in 2007. What was the first thing you thought when you learned of what was going on? Well, we had a lot of other things going on, too. Namely, we had... Uh, I came back from Boris Yeltsin's funeral, and I landed. And then, uh, and then that night, the government had decided to, to relocate the statue, which then went into... And then there was a whole bunch of rioting going on over this that was clearly sort of set up by, by mm -hmm. Russia. But newspapers were down, banks were down, government sites were down. And so then it became clear there was something very fishy going on. And, um, and that continued and continued. Uh, and ultimately culminated on, on May 9th. The Russians have a fairly well-developed doctrine now on using this kind of thing for political coercion. And in some ways you were the first. Estonia will always be in the history of cyber as the first place in which you actually had a, uh, a, an attack for it with political intent, or to put it differently, to, to quote um, 
von Clausewitz is the continuation of policy by other means. Mm. Uh, whereas before, I mean, not that there had not been cyber attacks of different types. I mean, hackings or, or I mean, in fact, DDoS attacks had happened often before, um, mainly for extortion purposes for small businesses. You know, usually your server, your server is overloaded and you're, you're, you have an online business and you can't do that, uh, doesn't work, so you, you, know, you pay them $10,000 and then they leave you alone. Um, but this was for political intent, and this was, in fact, uh, the first, uh, first time von Clausewitz's definition of war was, f uh, was fulfilled. Was there any contact with the Russians either during or after, the, immediately after? Well, the they all denied it, right? And of course, and because, you know, a DDoS attack, they're hijacked computers that they can come from anywhere. Um, uh, Sergei Markov later on said, well, it was done by my legislative assistant here. I mean, all of that is nonsense because you can't, uh, it's it's a criminal operation. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you know. Then there was the silly stories. Oh, they found one Russian in Estonia, some 15-year-old kid weighing 500 pounds. And I was like, no, it doesn't work that way. They what don't. what do you think the Russians took away from this? Would they regard it as a success or? Well, certainly the fact that a year later they used the same methods and combined them with uh, with uh, kinetic attacks. They they saw it was a success. I mean. Um, we also, for the Georgians, set up mirror sites, I mean, that, uh, to help them so they weren't completely, I mean, they, you could access uh, more important sites uh, by, we, you know, they would reroute to us, so. Do you think it's possible to get the Russians back on the reservation or back on the leash? Uh, they've been had so many successes, nothing seems to dissuade them. Well, if you look at the situation today, say that they were tactically brilliant and must be congratulating themselves no end on all that they did, have managed to do with social media, false stories, ads, uh, you know, breaking into Macron's server, Breaking into the Bundestag, I mean, it's all APT28, the same guy, you know, breaking into DNC. And as Comey said, they also broke into the Republicans, but they didn't dox them. I mean, uh, okay, tactically, great, great job. Strategically, you have managed to alienate, I mean, uh, the U.S. has not been so anti-Russian since maybe the 1960s. Germany is now really angry at Russia. Uh, Ma Emmanuel Macron, uh, who never said anything about the Russians before they tried to, well, I mean, uh, get his opponent in, now has a very different take on Russia. So I think what they've done is a failure. Uh, you have managed to alienate sort of many of the biggest countries in the West, the same ones you where you launder your money to, so I don't know, I mean, I would say especially if, um, as I ar argue, you should really tighten up on uh, money laundering, uh, especially when it comes to shell companies and real estate in the United States, uh, that, you, that it really, I mean, what did you accomplish? So Estonia is going to assume a leadership position in the European Union. The, the main pro there are two problems with Europe and digital or anything. One is the, um, the absence of a digital single market. And here, what I mean by that, in, in Europe, you can take a bottle of wine from the Algarve in southern Portugal, ship it up to north of the Arctic Circle and sell it there and not have any, you know, no custom, nothing. It all just, it's, it's just like, you know, just within a country. So, and so that applies to people, goods, capital, and supposedly services. In the digital world, I mean, my wife was Latvian. I mean, I cannot buy her an iTunes record across the Estonian and Latvian border, nor can I, you know, my friends in Finland can't do that. Uh, because there is every, uh, in the digital sphere, you have 28, soon to be 27 countries, and each one of them is cut off in commerce from the other ones. Well, in the United States, 
eighty percent of investments are from private equity and twenty percent are from banks. In the Euro in Europe it's the opposite. Eighty percent are banks and twenty percent are this comes from private equity. Now, nineteen seventy five, Steve Jobs. I shouldn't have said his name, but okay. There's a guy. I mean it's better if you don't know his name in the beginning. There's a guy, his long hair. He's recently said that he doesn't believe in bathing and it shows and sense it, walks into a bank and says, in my garage with another guy, um, who also has long hair, maybe he's along with this guy, in my garage I'm building something, it's called a personal computer and I want to name it an Apple. Now, I mean, how long before the secu security guards frog march the guy out of the door, right? So that if you have an idea, I mean, in, in the European model, basically, you, you know, your ideal customer, someone who's 50, never had a bankruptcy, has been had, a, you know, I mean, I mean it's sure. you, all low risk. And whereas the private equity, that's where the, you know, the risk comes in. You say, well, I'll put in my, you know, whatever it is. And if I lose my money, it's my problem. If, uh, if I don't lose my money, I'll make a lot, you know. So you don't have that in Europe. So that, those are the two fundamental problems. Uh, one is the absence of a single market, and the other one is the culture of investment. Uh, we address the first part, I mean, the, the lack of a single market. So you want to be able, you want data to flow easily across borders. So you could argue that we're uh, in the middle of a transition here, both in international relations, you see a much more aggressive Russia. Uh, in cyberspace, you saw the recent pause in negotiations at the UN. Um, you see the European Union stepping up with both d data protection and cybersecurity. Yeah. What's the agenda for the next few years? What would you want to see people look at and tackle? Well, I argue that what we really need to do is understand that uh, security, I mean, cyber is such a big security threat that we have to take that very seriously, and this has already been demonstrated. But secondly, that it, what, one, of the, uh, sci one of the aspects of cyber that we have not paid attention to enough is that it is, n it is not space dependent. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization does not have in it Japan, even though it's a very like-minded country, because mm -hmm. they're not North Atlantic. Yeah. In the world of cyber, when you see APTs 28, 29, and however many APTs we'll be discovering in the future, you know, they don't, they don't distinguish between where you are. They don't say, oh, that's so far away, we can't reach it. So what, what I would argue we need to do is get the liberal democracies to cooperate much more closely on mm -hmm. Uh, on these things, but I would see that's the f one of the future uh, the future directions must be the kind of cooperation that we have right now, and it's somehow beginning to work a little mm. bit. I mean, we actually have non -NATO, we have a non NATO country, Finland, as member of the Tallinn yeah. uh, the Cyber Center, and but I would say what we need to do is get all you know New Zealand, Australia, Japan. I mean, if you qualify as a liberal democracy and sort of you know rated by the Freedom Houses. I mean, then we will we share that information, and if you're kind of a pathetic, disgusting authoritarian <laughs> regime, then we won't give you that information. Um, but this this is that's one direction that must be taken because the threats are identical. I mean, they're the same people, the same you know same patterns. Everything is so it'd be kind of dumb to sit here and say, you know. is that the lesson of 2007? Come together, devise responses? Yeah, I would say that's the case. Patience while we did that. I thought it was an interesting interview. <coughs> um, could I now invite the first panel to come up? So our topic is um, lessons. What happened? What did we learn? 
and uh, I think we're fortunate to have two speakers who were deeply involved in the uh, incident of 2007 and who've continued to think about these problems afterwards. So why don't, uh, why don't I start by asking them um, briefly, because I think many of us know the story, uh, what happened from your perspective and what did you think? What did you think when you found out about this? What did you conceive your duties to be? What you needed to do? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me here and, uh, and it's such a pleasure to, uh, to be here and, and to see so many familiar faces uh, as well. Uh, first of all, I would like to make a, like a big disclaimer. Uh, like it is with the old war stories, as the time goes on, they tend to, you know, the battles tend to be larger and uh, one's role in those tends to get more and more important. Uh, and, and that's the way we are. Uh, so everything I say, take, take, take with some reservation because I spent 10 years and this, this old story has had time to you know, expand like a, um, like a good Tao. The, um, however, it is a good question and, uh, and one never forgets uh, when, where one was if something significant happened. And, and I personally found myself in the middle of uh, a crisis that President Ilves also referred to. And again, it was so difficult previously to discuss uh, what was going on, which unfortunately is, is not so anymore, that the statue, a removal of a statue can actually create a huge turmoil that the re removal of a statue can be exploited for political purposes, that it can bring out the worst among people and that can even bring about fatalities. And it was exactly the crisis that we were handling. I was member of government crisis committee and we were all located at the police situation room. And there were two distinct moments that I remember. One of them was I had a chat with our head of P government PR, because it was crucial for us to get the message out, to explain what was going on. We don't have a CNN station in our country. We don't have uh, international media in our country. All we were relying on was internet communication. The government, it was called the government online briefing room. And suddenly our head of PR, Martin Jasko, comes to us and he says that uh, we can't get our press releases up. It seems to be down. And everybody was telling him that, you know, don't bother with us with this trivial issue. Can't you see that we are handling a big crisis here? There are riots on the street. And we haven't seen any riots. I mean, we've had the First World War, Second World War, football game with England, and that's all. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, it's a pretty calm city. And, and can't you see we are, we are dealing with important matters? And, and, and Martin said that, uh, I think you don't understand. I think we're on the cyber attack. And then that settled. Another moment, five minutes, fast forward, I was sending an SMS to my minister, Minister Avikso. Uh, and I, I typed, sir, I believe we are on the cyber attack and I pushed the send button. And then I, well, it wasn't send button at that time. It was just a green button on a, on a Nokia cell phone. And, uh, and I thought, would he believe me? I mean, uh, you know, it's such a science fiction at that time. But I think the first critical lesson that we, we can take from this is that our ability to recognize the attack, to actually our leader's ability, because President Ilves was there, um, um, uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs was very uh, outspoken on the issues. Uh, our knowledge was there, and American can talk about different pieces of the puzzle that, that were starting to fall in place already, that actually we had an ability to define the attack we were open to the possibility. And, uh, and I think that was already, it wasn't a half win, but it was a, I mean, a big part of what turned out to be uh, a, a success ultimately. And point number two, I think, a big decision, it was all about choices. And I think I cannot emphasize that enough in the beginning and then I uh, finish with my sort of opening remark. I think people don't realize that the decision to talk about this the decision to go public with the attack, it was a conscientious decision. It was debated, 
among the principals in the, in the government, there was opposition. And the opposition said that uh, our officials and politicians probably lack the intellectual capacity to explain what is going on. Uh, opposition number two, or the sort of counterpoint number two, was that this is a shame. Estonia prides itself as a big E country, and this is absolutely devastating if it comes out that we are suffering an attack now. And nevertheless, we went against all our instincts, because in the government we all love, you know, if you have this classified stamp on a document, it makes us feel good and really in control. And we had every opportunity, because it was just the government briefing room that was, uh, that was, that was attacked at that time in the first night. And it was the, um, it was the political party, the prime minister's political party's website that was defaced. So we had every opportunity to say that actually the talking point went that uh, it has nothing to do with the riots going on. There was a technical malfunction and uh, you know, it, it bears no relation to what is going on in the streets. And we had no way of, of actually realizing that what was going on was the first full-scale full attack against the country as a whole uh, in, the, in the history of the world. So we decided uh, still uh, to go and talk about it. It was, it was hard, it was brutal. From time to time it was embarrassing. We faced questions that were difficult to deal with and we can go into those, but I think lesson number two was we decided to talk about it and it paid a hefty dividend and I would be happy to discuss more about those dividends. Great, thank you. Uh, interesting points there and I won't call your attention to the one I thought was the most interesting, but uh, why don't we turn to Meriki and get your uh, perspective. Do you want to tell people what you were doing? I mean, it's been sort of a yeah. closet experience here. Yeah, I've stayed kind of in the background because sometimes I find you get more done when, when you're not you know, out there in front of everybody. But I'll give a little bit of background and context. So I'm an expat Estonian. My first language is Estonian, and I was brought up in, in New York, basically part of almost every single Estonian organization that there was because my stepfather was in the executive committee of probably 10 of them. Right? And so Estonia was my life. Um, and so I actually started my network career building the backbone here at the National Institute of Health in the late 80s, early 90s. When Estonia became free and I was able to travel to Estonia, I had a passion for networking. And so I actually sent out an, an email. Uh, you, you had email already in the late 80s, early 90s. And I said, you know, hey, anybody doing anything with networks in Estonia because I'd like to have a conversation. So I ended up getting involved a bit about, you know, in the early days when they were building the networks. So fast forward, I ended up moving to California, working for a company called Cisco, and I started their security initiative. So this was in the late 90s. And I left Cisco in 2000, started doing security consulting, um, but I became very much involved and entrenched in global security op operational communities. People always say I have my own personal time zone because I travel a lot. And most of the people that deal with operational security communities travel a lot because you're not going to communicate over the phone or the internet. There's a lot of face-to-face -face conversations. Why aren't happen. you going to communicate over the phone or the internet? Because you never know who <laughs> might be listening. Uh, that was a trick question. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. But anyway, so fast forward to 2007, January. Mm. I had moved to Seattle and somebody said, you know, there's this security uh, conference. It's invite only, but we know you, you should come. I went, and sitting next to me, you know, the first break, I said, so, are you finished? He goes, no, I'm Estonian. Started speaking Estonian to him. It ended up being a man by the name of Hilar Adelaide, who a year prior had started the Estonian National Cert. Of course, he was amazed that this Estonian woman sitting next to him, how come he didn't know her? Security, what are you doing here, right? We created a trust relationship. And I told him that, you know, in May, I'm going to be in Tallinn, because I had instigated a network conference to be there. It's an entity called the RIPE NCC, which is all of the ISPs. They're, they're the ones that give out the IP addresses for Europe and some other countries. So fast forward to end of April, and I'm in California having some wine, you know, leaving in two days to go to Estonia, and I read about the riots. And I was angry. Here I am getting all the internet folks that to me, you know, could finally see how cool Estonia was and how really they embraced the internet. And riots, they sang for their freedom. What is this, right? 
So anyway, I ended up arriving in Tallinn, and then I started reading in the newspapers how there were sites under attack. And I'm like, huh. So I contacted Hilar, and he, I said, you know, you're probably busy, but I get that, but I'm here. So he had called me the next day and said, I need help. I'm trying to be vetted into these international, you know, trust, trusted security operational folks. Nobody knows me, right? I'm not trusted yet, and they're all here. You know, they're 100 yards away in the Vito Hotel. So I ended up uh, instigating this dinner where um, a couple of people that were Finnish and Swedish were part of it, and then Hilar. And the long and short of it, they tr created a trust relationship because there was a lot of um, activity in the underground uh, uh, chat forums in terms of potentially using May 9th to really start a large-scale global attack. And they didn't know whether or not this was going to happen or not, but the key thing was they took it seriously, right? And they ended up really creating a plan. If the worst case scenario happens, what do we do, right? And preparation is key. Preparation, transparency, and cooperation. And the one thing that I was very um, proud of was, you know, Estonia had issued its first ID card back in 2002. Right? In 2003, there was a very thorough risk analysis done in terms of you know, what are the risks as we move to a digital society? You know, what are the things that we need to decide on? So they made um, very informed risk decisions. Right? So in many ways, they were prepared when this potential incident would happen because they had already done an analysis and they were prepared for what we all have to be prepared for. Right, in our organizations, be it government um, or be it uh, private companies, right, we all have to take the same steps for any kind of incident response, and it's not gonna go away. I mean, the digital economy is here forever. So, you know, but one thing that really greatly helped from a technical perspective was actually getting this international security operational community to help out because they helped with filtering traffic, right? There was communication constantly going on in terms of we see this, can you filter these IP addresses globally, right? And I would say that was also a very huge strength. It's transparency and international um, cooperation. Great, thank you. Ori, maybe we can pick up on that point and say that we've heard now from Meriki about very robust cooperation in the private sector um, looking at it from the NATO perspective, and Estonia is a relatively new member of NATO back then, how did you feel cooperation was going uh, on the public sector? Was that a concern? How did you think about it? And Meriki, maybe we can then ask you how you interfaced with the government, but trust relationship is crucial. Estonia is a member of NATO. How did that work out in the initial days of the attack? Well, it didn't. Um, mm. And I think I can, I can be very blunt because um, there wasn't a format for cooperation in NATO for an event like this. And I would like to come back to the, to the fact that, you know, when we, I mean, let's go back in history, uh, and uh, not because we want to gloat or anything, how, how, how correctly we, and, 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 uh, and perfectly wonderful, in a wonderful way we, we did things, but, um, NATO started a process what, which was called NATO transformation, I think it was in 2002 or 2003. Mm -hmm. And the idea of, of the NATO transformation process was that member states should come up with ideas. Uh, what is the next threat that we, uh, that we should focus on and we should start setting up centers of excellence in NATO countries. So we had, uh, what was the big threat at that time? It was desert warfare. And everybody was focused on the desert warfare. Second was counter IED, the, uh, the counter IED operations, counter IED devices, and there was lots of money put into the counter IED research, uh, also, in, uh, also in this city. Uh, city. Uh, and there were a couple of, couple of other things like this. Estonia, lots of people think that uh, the NATO CCD COE started after the attacks. It is not correct. Our proposal to set up NATO CCD COE was made in August 2004. 
and it was met with sort of polite, um, oh, how interesting. <laughs> and uh, there was only one country, Estonia, that became member of that center of excellence. And we decided that, okay, we are not going to go for NATO funding. We're going to, to fund it on our own from our government budget. So we bought a rack and, uh, and we filled it up with stuff. And then we started to invest in, invest in brick and mortar. So the center was ready when the attacks happened. Then in 2005, there was one other nation who we were not allowed to tell what was that nation who also joined the center uh, of course, everybody, when the guy showed up in the meetings and started to speak in perfect American accent, everybody understood what the nation was. Uh, so we were two. And that was until 2007. I think in 2007, when attack happened in NATO Center, there were two nations and one of them even not officially a member of the, of, of, of the center. We always say that because of the, I mean, when we started to talk about our attacks and when we decided not to classify it, Again, as President Ilva said, it wasn't the first attack. Uh, several other countries had, had suffered attacks, but uh, had chosen not to talk about it. And uh, when we found our voice, we found something else. I think the biggest sort of brick in this cooperation was that Estonia's experience was started to being used. We were, and, and uh, let me tell you, it's not, it, it's not a, a question of right or wrong. I, I'm not telling that, you know, maybe Germany had some huge attack and they should have been uh, starting to uh, talk about it. Or US should have been published uh, their attacks because probably some of them were highly confidential. Uh, it was just an opportune moment to seize upon this event and talk about this new threat. So we found ourselves actually in the middle of the spotlight. We found ourselves behind the table that we had brought into the room ourselves and served some of the best meals there. So it was, um, I think it was a wonderful moment. So that tells you something about the cooperation. So we didn't have, there was nowhere to go in NATO. I was, I was meeting with, uh, with NATO Deputy Secretary General. I was even meeting with the Deputy Secretary General of UN at that time, uh, briefing them what was happening. So in that sense, the understanding was very good. But there was no procedure. There was no one. I mean, very simple issues. Also, President Ilves alluded to this. One of the things that we wanted to do was to, to ask for backup hosting of our government websites, Minister of Foreign Affairs, President, and, uh, and maybe Minister of Defense, some government briefing room. And uh, we wanted to ask from our NATO and EU partners to do that. The answer was unanimously negative. There was no government arrangement in place for such backup hosting. Why, why was it negative? That would seem like a... Because nobody wanted the attack to be directed against their country. Mm -hmm. Nobody was sure that uh, anything good would come out of it. There was no international obligation. There still isn't, by the way, any international obligation, although the cooperation frameworks are better and, and maybe this technical solution is not so applicable. So we turned to private sector. The prices for backup hosting went up five times, but we paid. And we still ended up in those NATO countries that were now being, or even EU countries that were now sort of uh, seeing the attacks, uh, which sort of uh, brought us uh, to the lesson number three, which is you can have good public sector cooperation, but in parallel, there's a huge part of cooperation that you do with the private sector. And actually, government may think that we are controlled. So we turn to this NATO country and we say, can you back up host our, our, our website that is under attack, probably from Russians? And they say, no, we don't want these attacks to be directed against us. OK, then we go to the server farm uh, that, is, that is located in that country, we make a private government contract, and this country finds itself in the war with Russia. The, um, the, the same thing happened uh, with us in Georgia when we had the Georgian war. The Georgians called us. I was one of, the, one of the people who got the phone call from Georgian Ministry of Defense, and they said, our site is under attack. Can you host us? And uh, well, uh, I don't want to undermine what President Ilva said, but the mechanics of this hosting, we, we had nothing against it. But there was a procedure that we wanted to go through and have everybody in the, at the same page. And Georgians were really impatient. 
and they couldn't, uh, they couldn't wait enough. So they called, again, one of our server farms. It was zone.ee. And the guys had just bought a new set of servers. And they say, oh, free stress testing. Of course, we'd love to have that. <laughs> and they started to host Georgia. And I think it was either MOD, Minister of Foreign Affairs was in Georgia, US server farm. And president was, I think, hosted in Poland. And, and again, what it teaches us is that we in the government, we can dis sort of think that we are in control of the situation. We can think that we can actually make decisions, but when, in fact, it is the private sector who, who actually has the control and takes the decisions. Because even if we, had, if we wanted to block that, it would have been enormously difficult. It's a private contract. I mean, how can you interfere into that? Well, th there could be some you know, security considerations, but uh, the outcry, public outcry, would have been, uh, would have been enormous. So um, that's a very long answer. Uh, there was no mechanism of cooperation in place. But I think, again, the fact that we started to talk about it brought about the cooperation. And the receptiveness of people, it, it happened in such a right moment, and we were in the right place. So we were serving as a proxy. So what followed was NATO strategy on cybersecurity, EU strategy on cybersecurity. NATO CCD COE was booming after that, uh, and, and all these things. So if I say that there was none, it was actually good, because so many good came out of that. Mariki. Yeah, I have a comment also. So um, at the event, the RIPE NCC conference, it, it's, it has global participation. And two people that were there were from Sweden. And one woman was actually the advisor to Sweden's communication, com communications minister. And so they both asked to observe when the attacks you know, would have potentially happened May 9th. So we were actually all in the, in the CERT, in the Estonian National CERT. And we saw the spike, yep, sure enough, yep, ha attacks are happening. And so what ended up happening was that they had just a couple of weeks prior in Sweden done a what if scenario. And the what if now turned into what, what uh, when, right? When would this actually happen? And I would say that because of the transparency that the Estonian government had, right, it now uh, had everybody, all the different uh, nations talking about what if this happened to us? No matter how big or small, right, do we have the resiliency? Right? What is our critical infrastructure? I think five years after that, I can't even begin to tell you, critical infrastructure was on top of everybody's mind. What is it? Right? And then how do we protect it? And it, it raises some really interesting, interesting uh, 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 questions, especially you look at somebody like Estonia, and all of the banks are the mother, the, the mothership of all the banks are not Estonian anymore, right? So what happens if you actually do have issues from an international perspective and maybe you don't, you don't have international links anymore? Well, you have to look at do you have enough redundancy, right? And so there's always some kind of technical solution to some of these issues. And then I remember in 2008, because, you know, some people, did know that I had been involved. And so I was the only civilian in Yerevan in 2008 at a NATO conference that talked about you know, what constitutes cyber war. And let me tell you, I was asked to give a technical talk. So I prepared slides to talk about IPsec, if some of you even know what that is. Thank goodness my talk was the second day, because I just winged it, right? Because it wasn't at all about anything technical. And you know, later on I realized the only reason I was asked to be there because I was technical and I had been there and I sat next to you know, actually the US guy and we had you know, the countries you know, all because I have dual citizenship. But it was very interesting because it is because of the transparency that the Estonian government decided to have that really it now became a huge issue globally Right? And thank goodness, because as we all evolve more into a digital society, we really do have to make sure that we're prepared so that we can understand what are the potential risks that we face, right? and especially as nation states, and then look at how, you know, what do we do? How do we prepare for eventualities? Mm -hmm. So are there downsides to transparency? What were the things that worried both of you when you 
think about being as open about the attack. Because in some ways that was one of the unique aspects of this incident is that um, it was not like many cyber incidents uh, in the shadows or shielded from public view. So you've all extolled transparency. What are the risks there? Two questions that we had to deal with that immediately uh, surfaced and we've, we had very hard time uh, answering those, uh, although I think uh, ultimately successfully. First question, who did it? And second question, look, it's not so sophisticated. Why are we even talking about it? It's a DDoS attack against the website. It's, it's really lame. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, uncool. <laughs> but if you think about it, hacking into Gmail account is also uncool. It's, there's nothing complicated in it. Buying hundreds of millions of Facebook ads is also uncool. Uh, it's nothing sophisticated. Uh, the, um, and also the, the attack of a government website, it's, uh, it's uncool. Although we had some of the moments that were, that were, really, that were really, really significant. I mean, nobody cares if the government briefing room is out in the, in, in the, in the media but, or, or in the publish, uh, public affair. But then when they moved on to the newspapers and, and media started to suffer the the, uh, or lose the advertising revenue, well, then media started to care a little bit more. And then uh, finally, when our banks came under DDoS attack, uh, and luckily they were able to uh, reboot quite quickly, thanks to some of the very fast decisions that they made. Uh, you know, if you cannot, it's one thing if you cannot check your president's website or if you cannot check online news, it's a completely different thing when you cannot uh, access your bank account. Uh, but, um, but we wanted to make a point that it, it, has, it has a lot to do about technology. And there are lots of, you know, there's a huge technological aspect in dealing with cyber. And there is really a need to understand the both sides. But the other, other side is strategic. When I, we had, um, it's not all about technology. If, if we take the techie approach to these problems, then yes, the attack was uncool. When I went to, the, to talk to Hilar and I asked the question that, Hilar, can you tell me from how many computers we were attacked? Because we were, and he started to laugh because it's a, it doesn't make any sense from a technical point of view. Your question is completely you know, unimportant because every, com every computer has a different uh, amount of computing power. Why do you even ask that? And I say, I want to know how large was the botnet. I want, I'm, I'm working on a talking point here. And I want to make a political point of from how many countries, from how many unsuspecting people we were attacked. So, so finally, when he understood my political point, then it actually became significant. So this DDoS attack started to sound. We came up with a, with a political talking point. Estonia was attacked from 175 <coughs> jurisdictions, from two to three million computers, which basically means trespass. From, uh, from two to a million uh, computers, including computers in Vatican. So, uh, and, and it is, it's a punchline and it's, uh, it, it, but you know, these were the difficulties to overcome the discussion with the technical, uh, technical side. And similarly, who did it? We had embarrassing moments, totally embarrassing moments. We had Minister of Foreign Affairs, because we had one IP address from Kremlin that we, uh, that we found and, and, and he went, did a press conference. And I mean, this is doing by lear learning by doing. This is, this is normal process. He went outside and said, look, we have this IP address from Kremlin, so, so they did it. Of course, it was just one of the, it was just one of the uh, computers that was part of the botnet. And, uh, and, uh, and again, they were very easily able to refute that. Uh, but then again, we, we wanted to turn the thing uh, around a little bit. Nobody talked about attribution by that at that time, and it was, and and even in the in the technical conferences that we had, you know, the, uh, there was a going joke that you know the question about attribution of cyber attacks it's it's a non-issue, it's impossible to solve. Not anymore, but uh, but back in back in those days, those days it was. And then we, again, we said, this is about technical attribution, and maybe it is really difficult, but let's look at the political side. Let's look at the strategic side. And then, again, when we started to explain who did it, 
Then we came back to these 175 jurisdictions, some of them unfriendly, who actually had a great cooperation with our authorities in coming to uh, sort of uh, counter these attacks, except <coughs> one jurisdiction. Boris Yeltsin was a great friend of Estonia. 1992, I, I think until 1992, 1993. In 1992, we managed to carve out a legal cooperation agreement whereby a policeman in Narva, which is the border city of Estonia, can work together with a policeman in Invangorod and chase a drug dealer. It's almost at the level what we now have at the EU. So our police cooperation with Russia was excellent. We had one of the most generous treaties with Russia on legal cooperation. If you look at these 175 jurisdictions, then you see one that didn't want to cooperate with us, and it was Russia. So their silence spoke volumes, and, and our point was that, you know, maybe we can just pressure it more and more and more. Let them deny. They, they said that, uh, yes, we have a good treaty, but this treaty doesn't actually apply in this context, and they're very good at that. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but our, my point, what I tried and I failed because, because this was in the hand of, hands of prosecutors. And they, they said that we can do it only two, three times. We don't, want to, uh, we don't want to go political here, although I think we should have. Uh, and, and for every denial of Russia, we should have come back and said, you know, why can't you do it? And let's, let's sort of elevate the, the discussion and, uh, and escalate it more and more. But, but, but the bottom line is that there's one jurisdiction who didn't want to, um, to cooperate again, and there you have your attribution. But again, that was difficult. Two hardest questions, I think, for us to deal with were the technical sophistication and the lack thereof, and the anti-attribution. But when we talk about the technical sophistication again, why did the attacks end? Did they end because we somehow miraculously came up with a magic solution to end them? No. These attacks ended because whoever was behind them, they decided to end it. So everybody who was saying that it's not sophisticated, my question to them was, in the forums that we had, one after another, was that, okay, so how do you put an end to it? How do you put an end to it? And there was no answer. So again, that's how, you also, that's how we try to overcome the sophistication issue. There's a lot for you to touch on here, Mariki, but attribution, uh, how do we okay. put it to an end? Uh, how did you feel about all that? Well, I'm going to get back to your first question, which was about, you know, where can transparency harm you? And I don't think it ever does. Mm -hmm. So the, the one side is that if you give more publicity to somebody who's trying to cause you harm, it used to be that, you know, it might be a script kitty and they wanted to have fame. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, I hacked this country, I hacked, you know, this company. But we're beyond that. We're way beyond that. And I think why I am in such favor of transparency also, because there is so much hype in the newspapers, in the media, that give you wrong information, that if you have transparency from the people that are knowledgeable, then that is a trusted source. And I have seen this over and over again. And quite frankly, it scares me a lot in terms of yet another breach, yet another <coughs> this. And then I look at the facts of what happened. I'm like, that's not what happened. Right? And so we're losing our sense of trust, and that really has to change. So I think overall with transparency, you can start to regain the trust and really go to the ultimate source of where things happened. Now in terms of attribution, attribution is extremely difficult from a technical level. And you know, but um, the world has gotten better from a law enforcement perspective, and I'm gonna speak purely from a criminal perspective in terms of getting added information so you can have attribution. So even though you can say, hey, this IP address, this computer, you don't know whether or not it was spoofed and you know, whether or not it was forged. And so when you're looking at attribution, you don't just look at it from a technical level, but you also look at other behaviors mm. that can then help you in terms of determining with reasonable expectation that this is what caused the event. It's been very disappointing to me because uh, I was at, a, at the RSA conference a few years ago where a, uh, a uh, cabinet secretary announced that Estonia had been brought to its knees by these uh, DDoS attacks. 
Um, it doesn't sound that way. Is that, that uh, what would you say back to him? I, I'm going to respond to this because it makes me laugh all the time. So the RIPE conference that was there, these are people that can't stand being off their keyboards for five minutes. Right? All they said, to, they didn't even know what was going on. So you had this international community of, you know, internet geeks. And all they said was, Merke, you know, you and your, your, you know, Estonia and the internet, it's great, we're connected everywhere. It's kind of slow, right? <laughs> slow. And then on Friday, Hilar actually did me a favor. He actually gave a talk about what had happened. They're like, wow, really? You know, and there's a subset of us that actually knew because, you know, we were part of, you know, helping from the technical side. But it was really fascinating. There, there, it was serious, right? There were some sites that were down. But again, the Estonians were prepared in that they made these decisions. This is not important. This is not important. These two things are important. I mean, and they have to stay up. Right, so the, the internet connections, right, to, uh, <laughs> to Finland and to Sweden, like, whatever you do, right, make sure that you have some outbound communications and internally to certain places. So when people say the entire country was down, I actually read an article just yesterday, and I actually copied the paragraph to Hilar this morning. He goes, I can't stand reading this. <laughs> I, I, you know, you know what, what, what does it mean? Broad to its knees uh, is, I mean, it was hard, it was difficult. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea what is going to happen. So when, when we, I think the biggest unknown in this was that in the second week, it happened, it, it went, it, it happened over a three weeks time period. So that was significant. And some of the significant services were down. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, you can say that it was it was it was it was hard and, and difficult experience. When we asked in the crisis committee from Hillar and, and technical experts, uh, how long is this thing going to last? What is your, you know, forecast? And nobody was able to tell. And and they said, get ready for three month campaign. Oh. So it was it was really really severe. But if you think about what came out of it, thanks to some of the decisions that were made strategic decisions and also technical decisions, we got NATO CCD COE booming after that. We got access to NATO and NATO started to deal aggressively with um, uh, cybersecurity strategy, of which we have now, I think, third iteration. EU jumped to the issue of cybersecurity. Uh, we, had a whole, we had the whole cybersecurity industry grown out of this, thanks to this. But most importantly, I think the heftiest dividend, Estonian e-services peaked after that. You would think that governments, uh, that people's trust would erode after this big attack. The biggest, I mean, the biggest counter argument are the facts. So you would think that, okay, we had this big cyber attack and the Estonian uh, citizens don't trust the government anymore, they don't trust e-services anymore. To the contrary, e-services boomed more and more government agencies came up with new services. More and more people started to use these services because we didn't lie to people. We said, yes, we have a problem. We recognized it. We unclassified 99.9% .9 of what was happening. And, and this 0.1 is probably has to deal with personalities and persons that, 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 that we cannot talk about. But, uh, but roughly we, we unclassified as much as legally possible. And that brought back dividend which was people's trust, which is extremely, extremely useful. This is the fundament that we, that we are actually uh, sitting now when we have a real problem at our hands. We have discovered a security flaw, flaw in our ID card. We have 700,000 ID cards compromised. So it is a platform that the government can now talk to our citizens and manage this crisis, which is a real crisis. Because people know deep down that, you know, it happened once, the government didn't lie. It happened the second time. Now we are solving the security problem in sort of in a fully transparent mode. And again, lots of countries can learn from this. This is again, it will be, it's very hard right now. Back home, it's, it's really hard. We have, we have people working maybe 24 hours per day, making, uh, working really hard. But again, in one year time, we can gather and look at this hopefully again as a best practice and the way how to deal with it. So, um, so, um, so much about bringing 
us to the knees. I think it was, it was highly successful. As President Ilves said, tactically powerful, strategically played completely to our advantage. Yeah, I'd like to make one point too. I don't <coughs> want to forget this. So one thing that came out of it, I mean, it was serious, right? The banks had issues. There were people 24 seven handling the attacks and it was, you know, there were also paid botnets. Thank God the money ran out. Whoever was paying for them was like, oh, forget it, you know, I'm done. Um, but what was interesting is that Estonia created the um, information, oh, I just, RIA, RIGI, uh, inf the Estonian Information Security information Agency Systems, systems Authority. Systems, yeah. I, was, I just know it as RIA.ee, and I go there for all my news. But really, it's, it's an entity where now the CERT.ee also falls under. So anything that has to do with overall digital communications and the digital society, that is where I go. That's the first place I go when I hear that, oh, is there an issue? You know, how am I affected being Estonian? Right? How is the Estonian ID card affected? How are other things affected? And so that was really good because you have a focal point where you can get all the information. So I don't have to go to 10 different places. That's my first point where I go to and that's where I get the authoritative information. So we've got a few minutes left. Uh, the second part of this, and I think we've touched on it throughout the whole conversation, is what have we learned? And I was writing down what I learned. Uh, and so it was preparation, transparency, cooperation, and trust. If you were gonna respond relatively quickly, what have we learned? What would you recommend to people who might face something similar in the future? Not similar in the sense of a DDoS attack, but this sort of politically coercive cyber action. What we did after these attacks, we went completely evangelical. And we, we really started to uh, talk about this. And one aspect, and I think Tanel later in the panel can, can talk about it, uh, we, um, we started to advocate exercises. And not only technical cybersecurity exercises, mm -hmm. but strategic exercises at government level. We tried in our, uh, mm -hmm. in Estonia for the first time in 2010, the first big strategic exercise. It didn't went so well, but it learned, again, it, ta it taught us a lot. So we approached the uh, European Defense Agency. And the European Defense Agency has now with us organized framework cybersecurity uh, exercises for a bunch of European countries. We have been eight times to Portugal, we have been to Czech Republic, we have been to, uh, we have been to um, uh, 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 Latvia and, and, and Austria and, and, and in so many, uh, so many countries. And we, we basically run a, um, a model scenario and what European Defense Agency gets out of it is they they start looking at where we see the, where the problems are going to happen if the, um, if the cyber attack hits one of the European countries. We have, we have and, and one of the things that we have started to see is in addition to the technical issue, there is what we call the framework issues. And this is what, what, what makes it somehow so, so difficult. There are framework issues that, that countries have to deal with. Uh, such as the transparency, is the issue classified or not? And we put them in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the situations and we test it. We, uh, we, another issue that, that people tend to uh, look at is the issue of time. There is enormous time pressure. Uh, the third issue is the cooperation, and not only cooperation between countries and non-traditional alliances, but with the private sector. And finally, there is the issue of authority. Who takes the decision? So, for example, we go to the country and we ask your tax authorities ransomware. Do you pay the ransom or not? And it, it sort of ignites a big discussion. But no matter what the decision is, yes or no, we go on and we start asking about the framework. And then we ask them, how long time, by applying all rules, would this decision take? Is it classified or mandatory for publication? What is the cooperation network that you need to apply? And who takes that authority? And you know what happens. We have been to m more than 20 countries now. And the trend is that the answer in these framework questions is playing what we call the triangle of impossibility. And I think this is a big part of what the cyber issues are all about. Everybody says that we have almost no time. We need to react very fast. Everybody says that the decision is classified top secret or beyond. Everybody says that we need huge amount of cooperation 
almost you know, beyond the alliances uh, that are traditional, including uh, uh, private sector. And everybody is pushing. The harder decisions get, the higher they get pushed. The level of president, the level of uh, cabinet of ministers, sometimes even parliament. And it forms a triangle of impossibility. Can you imagine? As I'm saying it once again. You have a five minute decisions to be taken at the keyword top secret level uh, in cooperation with the whole world at the level of the cabinet of ministers. It feels good to say that, but it's totally impossible. So something has to give. There are things that we can change. There are things that we can't. We can't change the time. We can't change the cooperation. But we can change a little bit about transparency, and we can change a little bit about authority. So this is, these are the trends that we are seeing. I think we have learned a lot over these 10 years. And I, I, I encourage Tanel, of course, uh, to, to tell about that. The Estonian Ministry of Defense ran uh, an enormously successful exercise. The 28 ministers of defense as part of EU presidency uh, in Tallinn, it, it lasted for two hours. Uh, all ministers were there taking decisions at the strategic level and debating. And I think it was wonderful. And again, uh, very, very, another interesting contribution that came out of the, whatever happened in 2007. <laughs> Great. Uh, Mariki, you get the last word. Okay. So I do think that uh, time is usually of the essence. And I think by creating trusted relationships across national borders, is really, really important. And you may not have trust across all of them formally, but in, in my circles in the security operation community, we always say, go drink beer, go drink vodka, whatever you want, get to know people socially, create trust relationships and personal trust relationships because they sometimes trump all others. And I'll also make the statement that I think national CERT teams are imperative. And so creating, that creates the hierarchy of when people are making decisions from a diplomatic perspective, and then who else then you know, has the authority and to inform you know, other players within countries in terms of what to do. So I think cross-cooperation or cross-national certs is also something that's very important. Great, thank you. Please join me in welcoming the first panel. That's very good. Thank you. Um, if I could, if I could invite our second panel up. Here we go. Oh. So the first panel was uh, what happened and what did we learn? Uh, this second panel uh, will be what do we do next? And so we have a great panel. I introduced them earlier. I'll remind you of their names. Marina Kalyarand, uh, Meryl Magra, uh, Johan Lepasier, and Tanel Sepp, who you might remember their bios from when I read them. But with that, why don't I invite them up and we'll get started. was smoother than I expected. <laughs> okay, let's start with an easy one. Uh, it's been 10 years. Uh, are we better off as a global community or as an alliance uh, in our ability to respond to this kind of cyber incident or the cyber incidents we've seen repeatedly over the last couple of years? Why don't we go down the row? We'll start with Marina. Where do you think we are? Thanks, Jane. Thanks for the very great question. And before I start, I'd like to say that it's a real pleasure to be back in DC. And it's pretty good to be here back as a former. 
<coughs> former ambassador, former, former minister of foreign affairs, not responsible for any more, for anything, for any more. So it's really great to be back. And another point, you see the Estonian attitude to cyber, gender balance, yeah? In all the panels. <laughs> so we're working hard on that. Where do we stand today? If I compare to what we were dealing <coughs> with in 2007 and what we're dealing with now, then I see positive trends and I see negative trends. Among positive trends, as the previous panel said, nobody was discussing cybersecurity in 2004. 2017, find an organization that is not talking about cybersecurity. Everybody's talking about cybersecurity. Institutions, organizations, schools, universities, everybody. So it's high on the agenda, which is extremely positive. As to the topics, they haven't changed much. 2007, we were dealing, what we were dealing with? We were dealing with attribution, maybe not using the word, but still attribution, responsibility of states for the acts of non-state actors, principle of due diligence, sovereignty, jurisdiction. The same questions are on the table today. Yes, there has been some progress. I'll mention immediately the Tali Manual, the work by the, uh, by the experts of international law on applicability of international law. 2007, we didn't have that. 2017, we have a pretty good theoretical book into what legal advisors and government officials have to look into. So progress has been made. Internationally, uh, as, uh, as Jim said, I have had the uh, uh, honor to represent my country twice in the UN group of governmental experts on uh, cybersecurity, G, the so-called GGE. And what I see, I see the ideological division within the members of the UN is growing. So on one, hind, on one side, there are like-minded countries. On the other side, there are countries who see the, not the advances of using cyber and ICTs, but see ICTs as a mean of interference into their domestic affairs, brainwashing their citizens, and so on, and so on, and so on. And in between, there are 100 plus countries who don't have a clue what cybersecurity is. <laughs> and, but cybersecurity can't be a topic for privileged countries. Cybersecurity has to be a topic for all countries. So the picture has changed, but still we have to reach out among like-minded, but also to, to those from the developing world. I'll stop here. Great. Merle, <coughs> same question. Where are we now? Yeah, where are we now? Then we can figure out where we have to go. Well, I think we've come a long way, uh, both within NATO, within e EU, and in Estonia. Uh, the topics are the same, uh, somewhat, um, but uh, the level of sophistication of, of discussing them is definitely higher. Um, well, NATO, for NATO, it has been easy to, to walk down the road because, as the previous panel said, um, before, the, before 2007, there was not much. By today, um, we have witnessed NATO announce uh, cyber operations, uh, cyberspace as a, a special uh, domain of operations. NATO uh, currently is um, tackling with issues about countermeasures, what to do. Uh, what is legal, what can be done. NATO is tackling with the questions of deterrence, uh, whether and how to build deterrence in cyberspace. And when talking about our center, the NATO Cyber Center in Tallinn, uh, we support the alliance in tackling these issues, uh, both in awareness raising with our research um, helping to raise awareness about these issues through the annual cyber conflict conference um, taking place tomorrow here in the States, but then every spring in Tallinn, we create the platform uh, for discussing, coming up with ideas for research done in technology, strategy, operations and law and throwing out ideas um, for, for people to meet and, and test new ideas. We uh, uh, promote compliance with international law through uh, mostly Tallinn Manual 2.0, uh, 
uh, that Mar Marina referred to, the most comprehensive guide on how international law applies in cyberspace, uh, something that was not there at all uh, 10 years ago. And uh, we are engaging in training and exercises, um, organizing one of the world's largest, most complex live fire technical uh, cyber defense exercise, providing really an opportunity for uh, training um, both for technical experts, strategic communicators, uh, legal, uh, legal experts, um, providing an opportunity for uh, the military and the civilians to understand each other's world and come to a better understanding of, of where there is the division of labor and, and what, what, what does this mean to comprehensively build defense. So, um, yeah, in short, I think um, we, uh, we've come to the realization that the digital ecosystem, in order to function better, it needs security, it needs um, cooperation and compliance with international law in order to really provide catalyst for change in societies. And, and the center, the NATO Cyber Center in Tallinn, um, is, is active in all these three fields. Thank you. John. Thank you very much. Um, 2007, I was a junior advisor of then Prime Minister Andrus Ansip, uh, who um, at the political level led the response to the, to the uh, um, cyber attacks and, uh, and the aftermath. Uh, today, I'm the head of cabinet of um, uh, Vice President Andrus Ansip, uh, who um, just in September pushed out a huge package, a revamp of uh, cybersecurity rules in Europe. Um, so we've, we've come a long way. Um, by the way, the mandate of this commission ends at uh, 1st of November 2019, so he will be available to do uh, a more <laughs> global role then. But I think w what has changed or where we are now is that the framework when we talk about our response or resilience or um, uh, proactive uh, engagement is, is much more robust and we take it more seriously. Um, just in September, as I said, uh, we pushed out a new package, but before, in 2015, the EU adopted a new Network Information Security Directive, which essentially was the first legislative piece in the Euro European Union to tackle the issue of uh, cybersecurity in a way that mandated the member states to uh, uh, determine the critical infrastructures that need special protection. It mandated the sharing of information between pri private and public authorities. By the way, the, the directive is still not yet implemented. It will be done so um, in the summer next year. But um, it wouldn't have been there uh, if, 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 uh, uh, if the Estonian case wouldn't act as a bellwether. Um, and we learn from that and we've seen that it's not only the issue of uh, uh, state actors acting with, uh, uh, towards other state actors. It, we've seen increasingly the profilation of uh, cybercrime in economic sphere, in, 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 um, in, in all domains of the society. And that is becoming a huge problem. And hence the, 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 the response of the EU of presenting a new comprehensive cybersecurity package. By the way, it's the only region in the world that has really looked at the rules and, 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 and understood that we need to gear up our action. Um, majority of crimes in some member states that are perpetrated are cyber crimes. And that shows the, the kind of a world that we, we are living in now. And that means that, we, the, that the attribution cannot go as it was in 2010. I mean, it, it's, it's difficult, but I think it's manageable now. So we, we, can't, we can't let the environment uh, to foster in a way that cyber crimes <coughs> pays. It doesn't, it shouldn't. Uh, we should always, we should have the mechanism in place in terms of, of the law enforcement, the police cooperation to, to go after the baddies. Um, but also, when we look at what, what can be done, we, we have essentially three fields where we operate and we, where we want to act. The first is enhancing cross-border cooperation, but also enhancing cooperation inside the countries, inside public and private entities. 
there is some, some information flow also due to the NIS directive from private entities to public entities, but not, there's not so much flow back from the public entities to the private entities. This happens more in the times of crisis, that's true, and that's the student experience. But I think there needs to be a framework there that enables this regularly. Uh, and I think what, what we had proposed is to, to establish a, a, a genuine EU cyber security agency that would facilitate and coordinate this, uh, uh, this building up of this architecture of, of exchanging um, very sensitive information through different areas. Um, secondly, we should look at what technological in, uh, innovation can do and, and where, we, where we can perhaps put more money where our mouth is. Um, we've been saying how important this field is, but if we compare to the to level of investments that at the EU level we, we, we put in cybersecurity, it's 10 times less than the federal investments in the United States into the same field. So essentially our PPP for cybersecurity for this five year budgetary period is 1.8 billion. Whereas I understand that this year alone, the federal budget uh, in the United States for cybersecurity is uh, around 18 billion. So I mean, there's a huge, magnificent gap that we need to fill. And what we propose the EU is that we will create a network of uh, research institutions um, with the center of excellence to boost the thinking uh, that is necessary to not only protect the critical infrastructure, but the overall ecosystem, the products that are placed in the market, the services, the software, it's everywhere. So it's not only a niche issue, and I think that's also something that has changed. It's really um, gone global um, and, and, and penetrated all the sectors and facets of society. Um, and finally, 95% um, of cybercrime could be stopped uh, if it went for the human error. So we go back to the kind of a very basic educational skills level of, of cyber hygiene. What can I do to protect myself as a consumer, uh, as a private individual, when I interact with others in the online environment, or as a member of society, to make sure that uh, my actions do not uh, create loopholes for the baddies to, to, to exploit them. So and, and I think this kind of a comprehensive approach, I don't really see that in other regions. I see that in the in the EU, and I think part of the reason is that, well, of course, my boss is running the cyber and digital domain in the European Union, but uh, also I think that we see the merits of cooperation and action at the EU level, um, and I think cyber domain is the, is a perfect example of 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 making things together makes more sense than making them separately. Okay, Tamil. I have a lot of questions, but we'll also leave a little time at the end for you to have questions. So why don't we go to Tamil? Thank you very much, and, uh, and uh, it is great to be back in DC also for me. Uh, um, it was just a sunny outside, so that's how I do remember DC from a couple of years ago. Um, I'm a bit torn with your question. And in terms of that, on one hand, yes, we have many different um, developments, especially on political level. The cyber package from the European Union, the second cybersecurity strategy, and NATO dealing with, uh, with that, uh, cyber as a separate domain, and that so many other nations um, are, are uh, developing their own cyber commands, uh, their cyber strategies. At the same time, we're still seeing so, seeing so many politicians who say that cyber is important. Yes, cyber is important, but usually we see also that there is not much comprehension behind this statement. <laughs> so um, th this is actually one of the one of the key points uh, that we took and and uh, decided to do something about this. And uh, Laurie from the previous panel uh, mentioned uh, the. <coughs> cyber exercise, EU Cyber 2017 for EU defense ministers and also NATO Secretary General was there. Basically what we did was, was that we took a, a simple scenario and, um, and asked ministers different questions during the scenario 
and the scenario was about attacks against CEO and military structures. What was really interesting, and, and I, can, I can tell afterwards about some of the key findings, but, but um, was, was to see really how, how ministers, at the political level, how they reacted. Because for each question, we gave just two minutes to come up with an answer. And uh, one of the points uh, that I, I really loved was that we talk so many, on so many, so many occasions that we have this gap between technicians and politicians, that there is no common language, no understanding. But that's not the only gap. We also have gap between officials and politicians, because politicians are inclined to do much, much more, but it's us, the, the officials, who say that, no, no, you cannot do that. So. Uh, there's a lot to learn from this. Mm -hmm. So having seen some of the negotiations up close, uh, I've come to the conclusion that uh, as useful as negotiation is, um, we might need to do something in the sense of retaliation or a countermeasure to maybe accelerate progress. I, let me ask that one first. I mean, do you think that we've had We've had, and particularly in NATO, where my, my standard joke is you can't say uh, offensive cyber operations in NATO. You have to call them active defense, right? Um, can, is it time to move beyond active defense? Do we need to do more if we're going to make progress? Do we need to think about retaliation? You're asking me? <laughs> you raised your hand, so thank you for volunteering. OK. <coughs> I'll start. And the others can the others can follow up. Well, if you talk about retaliation, then uh, I think one of the basic things we have to understand is cyber is just one domain. Mm -hmm. We have offline life. Life, it's there. It's not going to disappear. We have international law. In 2013, it was agreed that international law applies to cyber. In 2015, in the United Nations, it was agreed that international law. <coughs> U, uh, UN Charter in its entirety, in particular, applies to cyber. Which means that all the questions of, either it's Article 51, the inherent right of self-defense, or the Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, it applies to cyber. So we have to be very strict on that. Cyber is not a lawless domain. There are internal laws and there is international law and they apply to cyber, full stop. No questions about that. The big question is how? How does it apply? Because if there are lawyers in the group, and I see a couple <coughs> of lawyers in the group, <laughs> then to, to apply international law to the real life is difficult. To apply international law to cyber is even more difficult. But whatever we do in cyber has to be within international law. And now to NATO. So, so that was theory. And now we'll, you'll, you'll hear what's happening in practical terms. Well, at, at this point today, NATO indeed is, is, um, is currently developing, but has, has a position that, so that a response or countermeasures uh, can consist of, of any appropriate mix of tools consisting of economic, political, military, um, cyber, um, combination of, uh, a mix of, and there should be a toolbox ready to, to be able to use that. But when saying that, and, and there I, uh, the, the, um, the ball is really in the court of capitals, of member states, of allies, oh. who at the end of the day are the ones willing to offer their capabilities to the use of allied operations if they so wish. And uh, these capitals, if they so wish, need above all to have the skills ready. As, as Donna says, indeed, there are a number of uh, allied countries who have declared to have cyber command, uh, or setting up their cyber command, a, a number of nations that have declared um, that they are developing of of offensive capabilities. Now, I think it is important, yes, to not shy away from um, the fact that skills need to be uh, there and skills need to be um, developed. Uh, therefore, through the training and exercises, 
we, in addition to the uh, cyber defense exercise, are also uh, organizing a, a sister exercise where we take uh, uh, interested parties and, and test their um, digital forensic skills, situational awareness, penetration testing skills, uh, to be uh, able to have those capabilities when, uh, and, and improve them. So the question was whether we should use retaliation yeah, and in it's the a good, cyber domain. It's a good question for the... the I'm commission. from the European Union. Oh, I don't no. do war. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't even do active defense. Um, don't you have something But actually, I think in, in, the, in the cyber yeah. world, I mean, where civilian and military um, domains collide, we have realized in the EU that we can't afford this position anymore. Mm. And that is partly the reason together with the emergence of Internet of Things, and we think that we need a kind of a certification framework that's, that makes sure that the products that are placed on the market in the EU, uh, that they cannot be maliciously taken over by a, a, a vengeful actor. Um, but also, that raises an, an interesting question. What about in international trade or international economy when you have a, a player that does not play by the rules? Do you then use your, let's say, economic weaponry in order to respond appropriately? Um, we don't have the solution yet, but we, we see what happens in, in, in trade relations when one party does not follow the rules or use, uses inappropriate behavior. Then normally you will have a reaction, you will have a response. And I don't. Uh, I don't uh, preclude that in, in, the, in the near or mid-term future, uh, the EU in the economic domain will look into this. We have already started when we say that we need to screen the investments uh, that happen from third countries to the EU, especially when there are investments into critical infrastructure uh, and critical cyber capabilities. Um, so. I think that is that is a new and emerging uh, uh, field, also in the, in the not only in the, in, the, in the military domain, but also in the civilian and economic domain. So, if I was going to summarize that, it would be that the union is looking more at uh, economic measures, perhaps, than uh, military responses. Is that fair? Well, the union is an economic entity. Yeah. So, yeah. We don't have tanks yet. But <laughs> ah, we didn't hear that. We didn't, uh, go ahead, Tamo. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to bring up here one uh, one uh, key issue in terms of retaliation or, or uh, just taking action. Actually, I mean, you might have some some uh, cyber attack or any kind of any other attack, and then you need to decide what to do. Well, if you're in, if you're part of, of just the government, then it's relatively easy. You have the government session, you decide something, and then you act. An international uh, level, be it NATO uh, or EU or any other organization, is quite difficult because you have so many different positions. Now, in cyber, where, where things happen real quickly, the, the question of situation awareness is at least in my mind. How do you make sure that all these countries understand the situation in the same way? Because if, if you have different understanding of the situation, then you also have different courses of action coming from different places. So how, how can you can think even about some kind of collective activity in these terms? Um, it, it is extremely difficult to, uh, to, to manage. And, then, and if we talk about retaliation, then, well, the, uh, the notion of attribution was brought up already before. Retaliation against whom? And, and here's a question about situation awareness. Do we understand the same way? Who did what? I would say that, uh, that uh, we've been, again, talking too much about uh, sharing information and, and doing much more about this. Well, not much has happened. There, have been, there are some platforms working. But what we still need to do, I think, is, is to really fuse information coming from the civilian and military sector and put there also intelligence information to that because only then we can we can get to we can get much closer to it to attribution issue 
Yeah, if, two, I, uh, yeah, if I may just two small yeah. remarks on what Daniel just said, attribution. Uh, Eric, Lise, Lowry, I apologize for using wrong terms because although lawyer by education, I'm not dealing with that on a daily basis. But I think that even the question of attribution is well regulated in international law. We know it already. What are the principles? The same way as we know what are the principles of responsibility of a state for the act of non-state actors. The question is how to apply it to cyber. That's the big question. But we have the rules. We have the rules in place. And uh, to follow up what uh, Johan said, I think that a great thing that was proposed by the EU, and I, I hope that either has been adopted or will be adopted pretty soon, is the diploma, cyber diplomacy toolkit, which in principle said that the EU will handle cyber, illegal cyber op operations against the EU the same way as we deal with other violations of international law. So let's say the same sanctions or the same methods of retaliation that we have used or are going to use against those who violate international law, being it Crimea, being it whatever else, will be also used in the case of violation of international law in cyber. And I think that's a huge step forward. Although theoretically we know it all the time, <coughs> now it's made very explicit. The same retaliation methods go also with cyberspace. And that, that's a big thing. Meryl. Yeah, also just a couple of remarks on attribution. While um, I think it's important to recognize that attribution at its essence is really uh, ultimately is a, is a political decision. It's a, it's a political act. But in order to, um, to be able to make that decision in the high strategic level, it needs to be based on very sound technical skills and facts. And, and there, these skills uh, need to be trained and therefore I also, um, one shouldn't underestimate the importance of, of developing these skills of, of evidence gathering or first above all uh, the identifying uh, malicious activities, understanding that something weird or strange is going on in the first place. Then evidence gathering, um, digital forensics. So these are some of the skills that need to be uh, trained at the technical level uh, in order to be able to marry that with the political side and be able to, to make a decision about attribution. Yeah, there's a whole debate about what level of evidence is necessary to be presented to justify uh, retaliation. And Tyler Manuel deals with that. From a legal perspective, uh, from a political perspective, there's still some work to be done. Let me ask a question. Theoretically, the topic for our discussion is setting the rules. So I'm going to ask a two-part question here. Um, the first is, and you should note that we have people with experience in the UN, in NATO, in the European Union. So we've got a good spread here, OSCE, a good spread of the international organizations that might be uh, involved in this. Um, the first question might be, though, some have advocated that we need some kind of global convention, right? And I'm not talking about the Russians who've been advocate, advocating this for about 12 years now. Uh, no, actually longer, I beg your pardon, almost 20 years. Um, I'm talking about some of the corporations that have come in. Um, what do you think about the idea of a global convention? Are you all for it? Where would you start? Oh, James, that's a slippery road. You know it what is. I think about yeah. that. <laughs> well, my but, job is okay. to troll in delicate questions until they bite. So uh, go ahead. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try to be brief. You didn't mention the cooperation, but I, I think that we all understand what cooperation we're talking about, yeah? So I, I, I'd like to recognize, really, I, I'd like to recognize Microsoft for being so active and for making different mm -hmm. proposals. Having said that, I'm very critical towards the proposals. Writing a new convention, again, lawyers in the group, 50 years and we're still in chapter one or, or article one definitions. Because globally, I don't see that there is readiness <laughs> among the states to agree on anything specific in the cyber. If we couldn't agree on the GG to repeat what was said in 2015 on applicability of international law, there is no appetite for agreeing on something new, which means we start the process, we waste our time, and for me there is no difference whether it's a proposal by a corporation or proposal by Russia. Because I see that they want to gain time they don't want to look into the existing norms, but start creating something new. So I don't exclude that at some point we might come to the point where we say we have some gaps in international law. 
Either we should write something new, or we have to amend, or whatever. Don't exclude, but not today. Today, we have to look into what we have and start interpreting what we have. And then, at the later stage, we might come to new conventions, new pieces of international law. I think there is, if I, can I comment on this? Yes. Why support second. in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> we should thank the one person who applauded, however. <laughs> so uh, go, ahead. go ahead, please. I think the issue there is that uh, <clears throat> it's, it's an obligation not only the state actors, but also private actors to ensure that uh, global um, digital ecospace is safe and secure. And I, I don't really like this blame game. And I, what, I, what I sense sometimes is when this issue is raised that there is a kind of a push from corporation towards the state actors. You should, you, sh you, should, you, know, you should do something differently. You should do a digital Geneva Convention. You should, you should make sure that the global governance is there to deal with these problems. Or then the state pushing back saying, you know, well, we actually need to look at the product liability rules. You know, when you, when you produce a car and uh, it becomes a, uh, a, as a, as a threat to, 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 to other individuals, then the, the car manufacturer needs to withdraw it from the market or to make sure that the car is safe again. So if we talk about a piece of software, perhaps we should use the same kind of principles there. So I think there is, there's a kind of a, blame game going on, which I don't think that is helpful in the end of the day. Um, I think both state and non-state actors need to, need to uh, ensure that the internet is and remains a safe space uh, and secure space and can, cannot be misused. And if I look at the, uh, the internet governance, there is actually, we, we, we are making great effort to ensure that it remains a non-state uh, environment and there my question is well perhaps the corporation the private um, uh, parties should also make a similar effort vis-a-vis -vis cyber security to ensure that uh, uh, that the level of trust uh, is not diminished by the fact that uh, in the advent of the internet of things mm -hmm. people fear that they little fridges or, or Household appliances are taken over by malicious sectors. I think it, there is there is a uh, scope for action uh, from 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 cooperation to ensure that the, the cyberspace is secure. That was going to be my next question, but uh, at first. Marina and then if Meryl or Tamil want to add anything. I, ju I just wanted to say that once the cooperation was mentioned and the, as I, once I mentioned Microsoft, I do not feel that they are opposing something or they are, or they are putting blame and obligations only on the state. I, have to, I want to be very fair. I think that Microsoft is also proposing good, uh, good norms for industry. So it's not that us and them. On the contrary, Microsoft is uh, really trying to be very cooperative and I very much recognize that. And, uh, and I'd like to see much more, many corporations and industries being as active as they are. Not looking towards, only towards the state, but also proposing their proposals. If I was going to ask a mean question, I'd ask, why has only one corporation come? That's a, that's but we, we won't touch that one. We'll let, we'll let Meryl. Uh... Go ahead, Meryl. Uh, well, taking your question a little bit further and, 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 mm. and expanding it, and and for me, the, 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 the dichotomy between freedom and security uh, is really a false one. And uh, coming back to the topic or the, the core of the topic, discussing 10 years lessons learned of Estonia, I, I think Estonia is a good, uh, good point in case mm -hmm. that you can have both. It doesn't need to be one uh, at the expense of the other. Estonia <coughs> ranks uh, number one by last year's International Telecommunication uh, Union rank ranking on internet freedom. At the same time, it has always taken internet security uh, very, very seriously. It has always regarded that security by, di by design as part of the uh, approach to the digital ecosystem as such. Uh, therefore, you need to have both. Um, and there should be one on, on behalf of the other. Okay. Tamil, did you want to? No. Not well, let's come back to the issue of the multi-stakeholder model, which comes up frequently. as. Uh, uh, some people said, well, the, the, the GGE failed or collapsed, which is, again, an overstatement. And so, therefore, um, we have lots of volunteers to leap into the breach and provide us with uh, rules for cyberspace. And one of the candidates is the multi-stakeholder model 
seen in internet governance. Is, is this an appropriate one? Is this, how would you see moving forward with a multi-stakeholder approach? We'll start with you. Mm -hmm. well, well, first of all, yes, uh, GG failed in the sense that GG could not produce consensus report. But GG made progress in four fields. The mandate of the GG is altogether five fields. New threats, capacity building, confidence building, norms of responsible state behavior, implementation, applicability of international law. We made progress in four fields. The only one where we could not agree was applicability of international law. So we shouldn't forget that, and we shouldn't throw it away. We have to continue with the progress that was made in the GG. I don't think that anybody has to step into the position of the GG or UN processes. They have their, they have their, they have their objective, they have their purpose, they have their fora, states. And states should have a place where to discuss among states. So I see in the United Nations one track that will be kind of awareness raising, <coughs> educational among those states who do not have much awareness about cybersecurity <coughs> today. But we have to be very open and frank, no results. Just reading political statements, getting together, educating each other. And there, there has to be something where we have results. Uh, President Ilwas, when he spoke, he mentioned liberal democracies, or we can say like-minded states. But that's again states. And in addition, I see benefits of having multi-stakeholders, multi-stakeholder approach, where we don't have states on board, we have former states on board, but we have industry, we have private sector. Because for the first time, I would say, in the history of mankind, cybersecurity is something that governments, states only, can't provide, can't because there is so much in the hands of non-state actors and especially private sector. So the cooperation with private sector, crucial. The solutions uh, we will propose only in cooperation with private sector, if they want them, if we want the solutions or proposals to be applied both on a state level and non-state actors level. So yes, I'm, I'm a very strong supporter of multi-stakeholder approach in cybersecurity. And governments have to start finally talking to, to industry and listening to industry. Previous panel talked about our experience with the cybersecurity unit. We were lucky that those guys from private sector we can't afford because she's so expensive. She came, she came out of patriotism voluntarily to assist our government. And the format still works. Countries have different histories, countries have different roads. So maybe that's not the case for everybody. But cooperation with private sector has to be there. We can't avoid it. And the better the governments understand, the better for all of us. Let me the sooner they understand. Let me interject a question, though, that maybe the other speakers can yes, address. Yes, please. I promise. Which I'm is, done. no, no, no. That wasn't a, a signal. Um, so if, if the multi-stakeholder model operates in a structure created by international law and by international relations, and if that structure is under pressure or even fragmenting because of opposition from a few states, um, what does that say about the relative weight of our ability to get global consensus, the utility of the multi-stakeholder model? I'm always reminded of a famous Russian political leader who once asked the question, uh, how many divisions has the pope? And in the long term, he was wrong, of course. But in the short term, I think he was, he kind of had a point. So how many divisions has the multi-stakeholder community? Anyone? Well, that was too, <laughs> tilt, that one, that qualifies as a tilt question. OK, we'll go back. What do you want the multi-stakeholder community to do? And Meryl, we'll start with you. Well, when I look at the threats, uh, one of the, the, the um, the issue that, that comes up um, ag again and, and mm -hmm. again in, at a bigger scale is um, critical information infrastructure protection or the need uh, to, to protect our essential services. Mm -hmm. The concern for, uh, for our essential services that are being um, vulnerable uh, and not only vulnerable from private hack hacker hackers or, or groups of um, mm, organized crime but also are being increasingly targeted by nation state or state sponsored um, actors. 
So um, that is something relevant both for the civil side and the military side because uh, our militaries cannot really be uh, differentiated from the rest of our societies that are really um, dependent on, on computer networks running anything from food sanitations to, to communications. So the question is really, um, um, the question is about the public and private partnership there. The question is about uh, implying mandatory basic uh, criteria for the essential services providers and um, having clear organizational uh, setups and, and responsibilities within states and, and, um, and states also mapping or, or knowing where to turn to who are the ones responsible for these uh, essential services. So um, for this, NATO lacks uh, legal tools to imply these rules, but fortunately EU, uh, European Union, has, uh, is taking steps to advance the resilience of member states in the, this regard, in making sure that each capital um, is trying its best to understand where, are, where is the center for gravity for this and making sure that the mandatory um, basic norms are being implemented. Jovan, I think that was your cue. It was, indeed. I mean, I think a lot of it has already been said. Um, I also believe that uh, the multi-stakeholder approach is, the, is, the, is the, the right way forward. But also, as I define it, I also define it in a way that everybody knows their obligations. Uh, the yeah. state actors know their obligations. The economic actors know their obligations. And also, citizens know their obligations um, or role. Uh, I think the multi-stakeholder uh, model has uh, huge advantages when we talk about upgrading the basic cyber hygiene in the society. This cannot be done only by uh, by by states um, through their education system or campaigns. I think the, the, the best way to do it is uh, uh, to actually use the, the digital applications and uh, it's the companies that know the applications the best and their customers. And I think we also need to acknowledge the role of the companies in, in uh, raising cybersecurity. I mean, for them, it's bread and butter. I mean, if they don't invest into this, they're out of the markets. And they've, they've done a lot. Uh, and I think the, 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 the name of one corporation in particular that was mentioned now, I mean, they have a huge investment in the cybersecurity field that they've done over the years. And all, only now the state actors are picking up. So I think we need to recognize as well that the knowledge of how to protect cyberspace now rests perhaps more in, in the in, in, the, in some fields, in the private sector than in the, in the public sector. Um, uh, and there, again, uh, I talked about the certification framework that uh, the, the EU, uh, in the Commission, we proposed. We haven't yet decided on this, but I think for this to work properly, we also need uh, a cooperation between uh, private and, and, and public uh, actors. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, in order to, what we've seen so far, the pilot project that the EU has done in this budgetary framework on the public-private partnership in order to uh, put, pool public money and private money uh, to, to cyber research, I think that has uh, real value. So uh, I don't really see any field that we discussed today that is outside of this uh, cooperation framework or this multi second model. But again, it's not only about cooperation, it's about the fact that everybody knows what their role is and they act accordingly. Tano, when you talk about this question too, could you do us a favor and tell us if uh, or how you brought up the multi-stakeholder issue in your uh, war game that you just did with the EU? Yes. Um, um, during our, our exercise, uh, we, we explained different malwares to the ministers in, in a simple language. But our focus was on, on what effects this, this malware had. So that, that's to make it understandable for them. What are the consequences? What are the political implications? That's what the politicians need. And then 
at one point we also asked, okay, we, we have a ransomware attack. Oh, sorry, that was even a zero day attack. Should you share this information with the private sector? And ministers of defense said mostly no. And that was after we actually explained how this could be used by the private sector because the threat vector can be the same. <coughs> um, but while, while, um, uh, while I was listening to the previous answers, um, um, I, I got this, this vision in my mind, so this picture, one uh -oh. cartoon from, in, from Estonia. And uh, that actually depicts quite well also this public-private partnership and multi-stakeholder thing. Is that imagine a, a military parade. You have a podium or you have VIPs, and then uh, uh, instead of uh, marching soldiers, you have uh, laptops on tracks. Or you could, you could also have right now, uh, uh, so let's say, uh, private sector uh, people, because every single military system relies on private sector and on cyber. There are countless uh, cases where, uh, where also military, they take off the shelf uh, products and, and, uh, and use, use uh, for their protection. So for me, this kind of cartoon, it, it's kind of two questions. How do you, how do you visualize uh, cyber security? And for politicians, especially, how do you show that you have increased, uh, yes, during our gover government time, we have increased cybersecurity in our country? It's quite impossible to visualize. Well, you have to be really cunning. And at the same time, how do you visualize in the, in the same, same context this public-private partnership that you rely so much on? <laughs> Apparently, we have a volunteer to respond. Go ahead. Just briefly, sure. I just wanted to say that when we talk about multi-stakeholder, all of us were mentioning private sector, yeah. we mentioning industry, but we shouldn't forget about academia, uh, civil society, and IT folks. And I think what's changing with IT folks, they have come up down from where they were before, because they thought about themselves as an exclusive club who is talking about things that we mortals will never understand. We create only problems. And I've seen in recent months, and for example, at the uh, US Black Hat in Las Vegas in August, when uh, um, the, 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 the chief information officer of Facebook, Alex Stamos, spoke. He said that they feel that they want to talk to ordinary people. Oh. And now they want to talk in the language that ordinary people understand. So when I say multi-stakeholder, for me, it's private sector industry plus academia. And I'm happy to see the godparents of Tallinn Manual in the audience but also civil society and IT folks, then it's the multi-stakeholder. Not only industry, not only private sector, but plus. <coughs> Let me build on that a little bit and s that by asking, uh, we have here uh, UN, NATO, EU, and Estonia. the Global Commission on uh, Cyber Security, which was created before the end of the GGE, but now is thinking what it should do. Why don't you just all tell us, for the groups you represent, for the groups you've been involved in, what do you think we need to do next? And Marina, I am going to pick on you because you are the chairwoman of the Global Commission. And maybe you could start by telling us where you hope to take it, what you think needs to be done, and if you have any advice for our uh, governmental colleagues. Uh, well, thank, and, uh, thank you, Jim, and I'm happy to say that James is one of the commissioners of the Global Commission that I have the honor to chair. Uh, yes, and the commission, it was launched in March before we knew what will happen to the GG. So we had our hopes high that GG will succeed. But what, what we see today, what the Global Commission can do, Global Commission can work on the questions that are very simple and that are in the interests of governments but governments can't do, can't do on a state level for political reasons. I'll bring one example. Protection <coughs> of critical infra, uh, protection of financial systems in peacetime. If you talk to countries, everybody says, we have to follow that. But as soon as they get together in a formal setting, in an international organization, they start reading political statements. So we hope that our commission can proceed with something that is that is common, which is in the interests of all states, and from there go also to other fields. 
So in three years, we are supposed to propose norms and policies to enhance stability of cyberspace for states and non-state actors. So please stay tuned, Google us, it's cyberstability.org. Our first document will be ready in two weeks and we will publish it after our commission meeting in New Delhi. I don't want to go into the details of the document yet because we're still having very fierce discussions online about the content and about what we will propose as our first proposal. Um, NATO on, is, is currently on its way to um, come to a better understanding and develop um, its, its thinking how cyber defense uh, um, is better reflected in both um, policy planning and military planning. Uh, NATO is developing a, a special doctrine for cyber operations and the NATO center in Tallinn is the custodian uh, for the doctrine. Uh, secondly, um, in NATO, uh, there's, there, there are efforts to go ahead with um, reflect how to provide better training uh, for the vast majority of very, various allied uh, experts in cybersecurity. And our center is, is again helping to support in providing a vision for that of, of how to go ahead and identify the training requirements of NATO and then um, offer some of the solutions for that. And finally, uh, where NATO is currently going is, is uh, helping the allies to build resilience, um, providing a, a framework for, for member states to, uh, to have a better understanding of where their critical information protection, um, how, how these systems are being developed and, and who is respons responsible for that. So a sort of real efforts in, in building resilience of, of the um, member states. Great. John, you've been busy, but what next? Yeah, well, I can just sum up. Uh, uh, I think four steps that the EU needs to make in the, in the near future, uh, uh, medium future. First, really um, very practically implement the NIS Directive, the Network Information Security Directive, uh, so that our critical infrastructure is better protected uh, for future attacks. The kind of things that we saw when WannaCry and non beta happened, that they shouldn't happen anymore, that we have transportation system or health systems in member states that have taken down by quite blunt, uh, uh, unavoidable problems. Um, secondly, agree and, and start implementing the, uh, the new uh, certification framework for cyber secure Internet of Things. Um, I think it's essential for the for the future economic space, uh, digital space, uh, to be more uh, cyber secure, and of course uh, build up uh, an EU uh, uh, cyber security agency that would help uh, to to realize these aims. And finally, uh, uh, invest more in, in uh, cyber research uh, in the next uh, uh, multi-annual financial framework. What happens to ANISA if you create a new cybersecurity agency? Well, we create it on the basis of oh, ANISA, so okay. I mean, clearly there is uh, no need for replication of, uh, of different agencies. So we, we do renew the mandate, which means that we make it a permanent body uh, and also give it a, a bit of a more scope to act uh, in helping member states uh, to, to cooperate uh, in, in an event of, uh, and prepare better uh, for the cyber resilience, uh, both internally and externally, but also in, in the end coordinate the emergence of the, of the new EU uh, cyber certification framework. Mm -hmm. Great. I would say the question, uh, at least on, on military side, is, is, is being prepared. But the trouble is that we need to be prepared for the unknown. Uh, whatever smaller cyber incidents uh, we've had here or there, in some cases these escalate quite quickly. And, uh, and that's why, why the engagement of uh, political and strategic leadership is so important. So if, if in real situations we, uh, we, we can almost 100% say that yes, some minister or, or, uh, 
or secretary will say something or make a statement, then uh, why do we still shy away uh, of having them also uh, playing catering exercises? Because um, I'll give you one, uh, one, one anecdotal moment from uh, the preparation of the EU cyber exercise. Um, I briefed uh, some of the ambassadors and uh, I got one question back, uh, among other questions. Uh, but the question was that, do you really intend our minister to use a tablet? Well, we had a cyber exercise. Yes, of course. So, <laughs> the, the, there is no culture right now of ministers playing exercises or, or really going through these procedures. And we need to change that. Um, Lauri, again, for, from, the, from the first session, mentioned this ID card uh, vulnerability issue that we had in Estonia. It was our prime minister who, who had to give a press conference on that. And that was a theoretical vulner, vulner, vulnerability. So if we're talking about any crisis situation, I mean, you, you bet you have, you have a political level there. And um, another point here for the future. Um, again, sticking to the realities, we still have too many military drills uh, that go on without any cyber components. Mm. But cyber is a conventional tool in, in modern warfare. That, that's already proven fact. And uh, we still can separate cyber from, from the, the conventional means. And I, I do believe that is wrong. We made the video a couple weeks ago and uh, in it, uh, in the long version, you'll see President Ilvis uh, bragging about the, uh, the Estonian ID card and its merits. But fortunately, we cut that out of the short version. <laughs> so, um, it still has merits, of course. <laughs> no, and I think that's right. I think that one of the things that I would take away is what did Estonia learn? It was not to abandon its efforts to move to a more robust digital economy and I would love to know how you got around the what would be here immense political problems of creating a national online ID uh, that would be perhaps it will be less difficult in the future in the US but it, in the past it's been very difficult but let's let's save that one let's see if there's questions in the audience uh, please raise your hand please identify yourself if you don't have questions I have questions uh, we've got multiple questions so We'll start with you and then you. Please identify yourself. I guess you have to wait for the mic too. And then we'll go over to this side of the room. Uh, hi, I'm Nana Sajaya from the Voice of America Georgian Service. Thank you very much for this fascinating um, discussion. Uh, arguably, uh, relations, relations with Russia have not been this escalated since the end of the Cold War. If we discuss these cyber attacks as part of bigger asymmetrical or what many call hybrid war, how does the word deterrence translate into the cyberspace? And I would be very much interested in hearing answers from the former minister and the representative from the NATO. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. Um, well, deterrence is a lot about messaging. It's, a, it's, a, it's about making sure that if you do this, I do that. It's a message uh, getting to the point. And, and in order to uh, be able to do that better, uh, there are four conditions that need to be met. First is, is attribution. So um, we talked about it before. It has uh, both <coughs> a technical dimension, but also a political dimension. You need to be able to attribute um, the activity. Second is thresholds. In order to, to be successful in deterrence, you need to have specific thresholds which, where you draw the red line. You also have to have the capability of retaliating skills, something we also um, talked before, having, having skills, having, developing those uh, so that, that if you decide to do something, if you si decide to uh, undertake countermeasures, you are really able to do that. And finally, you need credibility. So. Uh, these are some of the four dimensions that are essentially part of the uh, deterrence and that also applies in cyberspace. NATO is currently in the process of deliberating and, and contemplating an, upon that. This is a process which is not finished yet. This is something also ongoing. Um, 
and and continuing as we as we speak now. Uh, anyone else on that point? If not, if we'll go to the next question. Uh, go ahead, please. Well, we've got three here and two over there. So. Thank you. Um, I'm a, a trade analyst in a think tank in Brussels and also a cyber fellow here at Columbia University. So uh, my question is uh, um, for the representative from ANSIP cabinet. Um, it seems like we were always criticizing countries like China, India for trade restriction, uh, restrictive measures such as uh, the, the security and controllable policy on screening of products and screening of uh, investment. And now it seems the EU is doing exactly what we were criticizing China and India for a few years ago. So do you think we are learning from these countries how to defend our cyberspace or um, what is going on on, on, on that uh, perspective? And also perhaps for the other speakers, do you think that's the best way of achieving uh, cybersecurity on, us, on our space or are there less res trade restrictive measures that we can use to achieve uh, cybersecurity? That's a really it's good question. But it's a, I mean, firstly, the fact that the EU hasn't done any investment screening does not mean that the member states haven't done it. And they've done that uh, at several levels uh, uh, for years. Um, for, for, let's, for critical economic sectors that have linkages with national security, the EU has as a clear and established policy of uh, how to make sure that uh, there are no adverse effects of uh, investments coming from, from third countries. Um, and I think th the only thing that has changed now is that we recognize that uh, uh, cyber is one of these critical sectors uh, and uh, places of economy that we need to be more aware uh, and that's it. Okay, uh, we had one in the, oh, Mike, did you want to save yours for last or did you want to, go ahead, Michael Schmidt. <laughs> I'll introduce at, you. At your leisure, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is a question for both Marina and Merla. Uh, as an international lawyer, your comments were music, every syllable was music to my ear. How, however... Did you say I, music or amusing? No, music. Oh, music. okay. However, I've just returned from Korea where we had an event not unlike this and, and had many of the same discussions. And the international lawyers said exactly what you said. But when the policy folks took the, uh, took the podium, their response was international law isn't sufficient to defend us from the threat. In other words, it doesn't provide sufficient responses. They, in particular, mentioned deterrence and said that deterrence is unlikely to work well in cyberspace because of the problems of attribution, because countermeasures are not available against non-state actors, because due diligence imposes an obligation of, uh, of, prevent or of uh, stopping hostile cyber operations but not preventing them. And they went on and on and on. So my question is the same to both of you. It's great that there's international law. I like it very much, as you know. But will it really be effective against severe threats posed by states that don't, them, that don't themselves respect international law? It's very complicated when you deal with international law. My background, I come from Estonia. So I would say that for Estonia, international law has different meaning than maybe for some other countries. Big countries, superpowers, tend to change international law whenever they have time to do it or, and, and willingness to do it. Small countries, for us, it's predictability, it's the frames, it's our future, we, we know what will happen. Uh, I, don't wa I was a politician at some point, but uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty hesitant about the knowledge of politicians about international law. And here, it is the role of legal advisors it is the role of academia to explain what does international law say or what are the options of deterrence attribution under international law. Tiley manual, 600 pages. I haven't read all of that. And I'm sure that politicians do not read it. So it's easy to say it does not apply, there is not enough. But first, they should come to you and ask, Mike, what should I do? What are, what are the possibilities? What can I do under international law? And after they have an hour or two with you, and if they still then have questions, 
I'm ready to discuss it with them. But at the moment, I would have gone first to international lawyers and asked for their advice, not start speculating, uh, not knowing the substance enough. And I'm definitely not in a position to answer their questions. So the legal advisors, the people who really do know international law, have to give their advice. Mike gave his advice, but he's a academician. He's not legal advisor at the moment. If I were foreign minister, I would have hired you. Okay, but that's. <laughs> but but we need now somebody from the from the government side to say how they see one, two, three, four different questions of international law. Yeah, on my side, I would add that um, international law in itself, in an abstract form, does not really protect us. Uh, is not a, a kind of like a magic shield that protects us, and this has been the case. Uh, throughout the uh, 20th century, and, and it, it, it also applies in the 21st century. Mm, Tallinn Manual and, and many of the other uh, efforts of like-minded nations um, in developing ways how international law can apply in cyberspace offer tools for nations to use them, but it is up to state practice to develop those tools. And those are tools that are only part of the tool set of a comprehensive approach. I think, I mean, thinking back of Estonia's experience uh, at the aftermath of the Second World War, uh, international law did not do the magic. At the end of the day, yes, it uh, offers possibilities uh, to make your case in international arena if, uh, if one speaks the language of international law fluently, but it is not enough. You also need some um, real-term military capabilities in addition to this, because the, the only good defense is comprehensive <coughs> defense. And as we've been di discussing before, um, both in developing the, uh, the ways to respond, uh, countermeasures in cyber, um, Cyber, cyber set alone is, is, is not enough. You need uh, to complement that with measures uh, in kinetic sphere, economic, diplomatic, and so on. You need to develop them all. And the same applies for international law. Um, you need that, but it, that needs to be put in effect with uh, some real-term capabilities as well. And ultimately, it is the comprehensive defense, the comprehensive approach that, that, only, that only that can be successful today as we speak of hybrid threats of an opponent who is very cunning, who is, uh, who is using um, various tools, um, hiding, uh, making it difficult to attribute not only in cyberspace, but also in, in conventional sphere, as we, see, as we saw was the case in the uh, occupation of Crimea and the war in <coughs> Ukraine. So it's all these developments um, throughout the field of the hybrid threats and, and the question how that applies to international law, but also what are the lessons that we learn from that, from Russia's war in Ukraine uh, from 2014, and whether we learn that lesson and whether we, we build up uh, areas where we are vulnerable, not just in international law, but also real-term military uh, skills and the political courage to use them, which is ultimately the most important thing, the ability of the um, statesman to make the decision to fight back or to defend oneself. That's what matters, and that is one of the lessons also that Estonia has learned after the end of the Second World War. Uh, one needs to fight back. Uh, Tamal, do you want to add anything? I participated in the panel this morning in John Hopkins Institute, and there was that very uh, interesting debate about privacy. And uh, just to draw a very crude parallel, um, one of the panelists uh, there said, well, you have a law that says it's illegal to break into somebody else's house. So, but that does not deter you to apply locks or burglar alarms or, in, depending on your level of paranoia, booby traps <laughs> to make sure that nobody does it, no matter that the law is there. And I think the same analog applies. 
camel. <laughs> yes, 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 law applies. And of course, uh, coming, fr coming from, again, Minister of Defense and representing also Estonian Defense Forces, of course, we follow the law. And I'm just wondering, <coughs> um, and then, yes, we all, we all ad adhere to these principles, but practical applica applicability sometimes uh, uh, questions. At, at least, uh, I'm uh, sometimes doubtful about the practical applica applicability. If you are dealing with um, um, uh, with uh, with this vagueness of attribution, if uh, there's there's this uh, example that so that we use quite often that uh, what's the difference between uh, kinetic and, and and cyber? That with a kinetic you have a battalion. A battalion commander gets a gets a order that move to the east. Okay, the battalion then starts preparing and so starts moving at one point. In cyber, uh, you get a commander gets an order that press enter. The time scales are so different. Within half an hour, the battalion is nowhere yet. Or maybe maybe it's, it's furthering yeah, this destination, but in cyber everything would have happened already. Oh. And then and in in this terms, I'm, I'm absolutely I agree. We need to we need to follow international law and and, and uh, I've used Stalin manual also uh, to to really argue some of our talking points once in a while. But but it it, it is simply difficult. That's a good one. We had two questions on this side. Let me take them both in the interest of times if people still want to ask them. Could you hold up your hands if you had a question? No, no, yes, one, two. Thank you very much. My name is Omar Aruna. I'm the past immediate ambassador of the Republic of Benin to the US. I'm also a managing partner with the US Africa Cybersecurity Group. My question is uh, probably to the minister, former minister of defense in relation to the global, uh, uh, basically, talk about cybersecurity. When she talk about uh, at the UN, there is uh, various faction. Uh, when we talk about cybersecurity, I'm assuming that when you're talking about the one who have no clue, are uh, probably from that part of <coughs> my world, basically. Uh, considering that uh, we have most, I mean, I think uh, the five uh, fastest growing economy coming from that part of the world. What is your view in, uh, uh, first, the lesson learned from Estonia? How can it be applied to some African country? Because I'm assuming that uh, in this stage, they are where Estonia was some decades ago. That's one thing. The second question is in relation to how do you view, really, how do we bring into that fold the international global talk, the African country. Thank you. Before we do that question, perhaps you could just hand your microphone to the lady right there, and then that will be the last question. Hi, I'm an intern at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. I know that a couple years ago at the Whale Summit, NATO said they would consider cyber attacks on a case-by-case -case basis for Article 5. What is NATO doing to create a clear doctrine for this because like it's clear if a country bombs a NATO alliance country that clearly could invoke article 5 but a cyber attack could just manipulate like health records or financial records that could cause deaths as well so what it, what would consider what would NATO consider a declaration of article 5 Okay, if we can take the two questions, the first ambassadors and then the NATO. Don't everyone leap on the NATO question because that's the f more fun. Take the ambassador's question first. Thank you very much for raising it. And what would I say? I, I would say that definitely we are not going around the world and telling everybody we are so good, look at us. Uh, our experience is the only right experience. No. <coughs> what we are saying, we have our path. It was successful for our country. If there is anything you can learn from our experience, we are happy to share. We are doing it through development cooperation projects. We are doing it through the organization of uh, American states, not so actively in Africa, but still, for example, in Tunisia. And last year, I happened to be at the Smart Africa Conference in Rwanda. 
And I would say that the level of discussions there was very good. It was very good. But, but we have to more engage with those countries who are not vocal today, who are not speaking up. We can't say that Africa is not Africa. Africa is different states, different countries, different levels of understanding. But we have to bring and try to bring everybody on the same level. The same in Asia, the same in Latin America, the same in the other, uh, other spheres, uh, other fields of the world. And did I answer? Was it? I can follow up. Yes, I'm not going to talk about NATO. So, so, yeah, <laughs> you, you can do. So, so, in principle, I don't want to say that all African countries are on the same level and do not have knowledge. No, they have. And if there is anything we can be of assistance, don't hesitate to turn to us. We have our limitations, financial and human resources limitations, but we have experience, and I'm sure that we can find money to, 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 to do the projects. And in the end, we have uh, SDGs, we have UN being very active in that field. So the, the money is out there. It shouldn't stop because of financial reasons. But you have to make up what is, uh, from our experience, you'd like to learn from. If I, if I may follow up the pre, uh, from a foreign minister to the question, what are some of the lessons learned that, uh, of Estonia that can also be applied in Africa? I'd like to make a reference to a report uh, that the World Bank uh, um, drafted last year, the World Development Report on Digital Dividends, so which, which was ultimately concluded that, yes, in order to uh, draw dividends from digita digitizing your society, um, of course, uh, connectivity and technical uh, um, opportunities uh, to create connections are important. But ultimately, the, really the, the uh, proof of the pudding is in analog services. It is ultimately the role of, uh, of the governments mostly to provide some of the very basics, the uh, legislation as well as the skills and learning. And without these analog services, um, you do not really draw dividends from the digital lifestyle. So you need both connectivity but also legislative framework allowing to have dividends as well as, as initiatives um, that build on people's uh, skills learning to draw really dividends uh, from the digital lifestyle. And I think that is, <coughs> that is also a lesson of Estonia that uh, the former president referred to in his intro, as, as well as some of the lessons learned that, that we keep on re, uh, reinpor uh, reinforcing, that it's not all about digitization. It is also very much about the political will the political will to create laws and the political will to offer opportuni opportunities uh, for education and learning. Very quickly on NATO and Article 5, or oh, you want to break in? Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. have a very short remark on the ambassador's question. I think on, on the overall digital ecosystem in Africa, I think we sometimes underestimate how vibrant it is, especially in Kenya and, and some other countries, and how important it is for us also to engage with African countries as equals in the, in the issue of cyberspace, for example, and how to build up a more robust uh, uh, cyber system. We are doing it in Europe, and I think in parallel you are doing it in Africa, and I think it will be extremely uh, uh, useful to do it together. Uh, and I'm very happy in this note that the, the upcoming European Union African Summit uh, will also dedicate part of its uh, uh, deliberations on, on, on digital issues and, and cyber in particular. So I think um, uh, we, we need this cooperation to happen. Um, Just let me point out that uh, last year CSIS did a study with the Inter-American Development Bank that looked at lessons small countries could draw from Estonia, Korea, uh, the UK, a few others that were useful in thinking about how to move forward. What are the parts you would need, like political will, legal framework. So you might, if you want, I can later send you the references to that Inter-American Development Bank study. But go ahead on NATO, please. On NATO and Article 5, I think it's very important to maintain that there is nothing automatic about Article 5, um, really. It doesn't automatically apply. Uh, Article 5 requires North Atlantic Council, be it at the level of ambassadors, um, ministers, or head of states and governments to gather and make the decision. Um, and that applies also for any country um, 
bombing uh, other country. Now, in cyberspace, NATO has uh, um, maintained, um, or, or at, at its highest level, in 2014 Wales Summit, that cyber defense is part of the collective defense, which means that if Article 5 is to be uh, activated, cyber can be part of the measures uh, applied, along with political, military, or other diplomatic measures, just as uh, in, or any other response that allies deem to be the most appropriate at that point. May, may I add here, um, on, especially on, on NATO and Article 5, it is always, and it will be always, the question of, a question of, of effects. What kind of uh, attack are, are we talking about? And what is impacted? And based on that, politicians or, or um, ambassadors at NAC can make a decision whether it is Article 5 whether or not. And um, it needs to be consensus-based decision, as are all decisions made in NATO consensus-based. So everybody needs to. No one can be against it. Which brings back to the situation awareness. <laughs> Well, it's been a robust panel. We certainly covered a lot of ground. Uh, I don't think we have time for any more questions. Uh, if, if, uh, if you would join me in thanking our panelists for this. Thanks. 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 Thanks.